Leonardo da Vinci is uh, the author of the two most famous paintings in history. The uh, Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. He is also perhaps the most valuable painter. Uh, last week, uh, a drawing of Leonardo, the size of a post-it, a tiny drawing of a, the head of a bear, was sold for more than $12 million. To give you an idea of how much he is appreciated uh, today. But Leonardo was not just a great artist. Leonardo uh, studies anatomy, fossils, uh, birds, the flow of water, uh, mechanics, the reflection of light, and so many other things. He is the first one to understand how the heart works. And, uh, and, and he's able to draw all these things, geology, mechanics, uh, so much so that Leonardo imagines hundreds of years before discoveries that we now use and cherish, such as uh, the bicycle, the helicopter. But more than that, he conceives uh, a modern city. He imagines uh, so many things. In his personal life, he was a, a very joyous man. He liked uh, to dress in bright colors. He was uh, a lover of animals, a vegetarian, and he would always wear just linen because he didn't want to wear leather or anything that was dead, he would, uh, he would say. And this is a contemporary work by a, a, a young artist today called Gabriel Lavoye from Canada about Leonardo, is that he, this apparently, uh, today we think that art and the disciplines connected to the art are incompatible with scientific knowledge. So we frequently have those people that study science, that, that study biology, uh, physics, mathematics, and then those that study painting and, and music and art or sculpture. What Leonardo teaches us is that both of these activities are connected and can help us uh, do each better. So, for example, Leonardo was perhaps the greatest draftsman the world has ever known. He could draw everything and he kept notebooks of this. So he captures and understands and, and draws the muscles and the bones. He goes to uh, dissections and so he sees everything. He draws nature, he draws the water. And all this art that he does allows him to understand nature better. And at the same time, the understanding of nature allows him to be a better artist. So for example, people say, well, how could he draw in the Mona Lisa, the, the greatest smile in the world? But it was not only that, that he practiced drawing the face, it's that he actually knew how the muscles of the face were built. He actually seen them. He understood how they contracted. How, so his uh, understanding of art and science makes him uh, be able to be a better artist, to be a better thinker, and to be able to imagine the future. You see, all of these things uh, are 
his contributions. And I would also like to say that Leonardo changes the way that art is perceived in society. In those days, uh, the painters were seen uh, like other artisans. But Leonardo says, you know, that, 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 that the painting is not just done with your hands, it is also done with your mind. And uh, he envisions, for example, perspective to create on a flat surface, it could be a paper or it could be uh, a canvas, an image that has profundity, that has depth, that looks as if it were, it had three dimensions. Well, to do that, you have to know optics, you have to understand how light works. So art is then not just a, a, a mechanical skill, but it is also a way of thinking and also a way of imagining. Leonardo all the time is thinking. And in his life, he, contrary to today, if you uh, buy any of these books of success. You know, they kind of make you be very methodical, very predictable, put your goals down. Do Leonardo had a very open way of looking at the world. In many ways, he never lost the curiosity of a child. You know how when little kids uh, are curious about everything and they ask questions like, why is the sky blue? Or why would uh, a fish in the water move faster than a bird in the air if water is heavier than air? All these questions that kids ask all the time and that as we get older, people stop asking them or they seem silly. Well, Leonardo always was asking these questions. He was always thinking. And he believed that we should have time to think, that we shouldn't get so busy that we can't think anymore. So in many ways, what Leonardo teaches us is how do we integrate knowledge? How do we fuse the creative and the scientific? But also, how do we maintain a mind that is fresh and that is always asking questions? And that incorporates joy as an essential part of everything. He sometimes, you know, when he saw that people were having birds in cages, he used to buy these birds that were prisoners and he opened the cages and set them free. Uh, or when he paints the Mona Lisa, he tries to make this girl so happy and he brings jesters and musicians. So the incorporation of, of joy, of questions, the freedom of thinking, uh, the ability to do many things, not to be just specialized in one or, or, or another, and the understanding that everything connects. This and more is Leonardo da Vinci. He was born in a, in a town uh, precisely called Vinci, close to Florence. And he's the son of a notary uh, Sir Piero, and uh, a peasant girl called Caterina Lippi. So uh, his parents never, never married. And uh, Leonardo was uh, illegitimate, in, as you may say. But in a certain way, this was a good thing for him. Because in those days, if uh, you were the son of uh, a doctor, you were expected to be a doctor. Or if you were the son of a whatever, you know, a profession, a farmer. And probably had he been, you know, uh, the son of a, of a marriage and so on, he would have been expected to carry on the profession of his father, which was a notary which would have probably been 
a disappointment for uh, for Leonardo. And it is interesting also that uh, he studies a little bit, but he doesn't have also a formal education. That can also be an advantage because he grew up uh, asking questions and uh, thinking. And of all his, his relatives, uh, the father was very hardworking. The only ones that were not very hardworking was the grandfather and the uncle. They were kind of carefree, they loved life. And, uh, and they were really the main forces in Leonardo. So they teach him to, to look at nature, to enjoy birds, to take long walks. Uh, and uh, in one occasion, there was this big cavern that was dark. And uh, Leonardo wanted to enter, but he was a little bit afraid of, of, of what he would find there. And so finally he gets the courage and he enters. And then he has a, a candle and he can see the fossils that are there in the, in the walls. So it is the first time in which his curiosity overcomes his fear. It would be a very important in uh, his career. So the, the, the grandfather uh, dies when uh, Leonardo is about 12. And so then he goes to Florence to live with, uh, with his father. Florence at the time, well, and still is, it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world and uh, a place that is uh, ideal you know, for artists. Uh, he, he, he shows very early that he wants to be an artist. And he's so insistent that his father takes him to uh, a workshop uh, of an artist called Andrea del Verrocchio. At the time, uh, the main patron in Florence was Lorenzo di Medici. We will talk about him also next week when we talk about Michelangelo. He uh, was very rich, but he was also a man who generously uh, supported artists. So Leonardo, uh, if we look at his writing, he was a, a left-handed. And also, you know, in, in those days, people uh, thought that it was bad to be left-handed. And sometimes with uh, left-handed people, they tied their hands in the back of their, to their back, and they forced them to use their right hand. Uh, but again, Leonardo, you know, his father didn't, didn't, was not too worried about what he could, he basically gave him the freedom to. And so you, he kept his notebooks. And if you notice, he writes from right to left. So, you can only see, see what these letters mean if you put them in a mirror. Some people thought, oh, maybe he's writing in code. It's not really that. What happens is that if you're a left-handed person and you write different than the right, your, your, your hand is full of ink. So writing from right to left allowed him not to get his shirt dirty with ink. So here you have uh, him in this workshop where he learns painting, he learns uh, sculpture. Uh, this is a, a sculpture that Andrea del Verrocchio does. And there are some uh, critics that believe that uh, it, it was him who posed for this image. And here you clearly see his first drawings. To your left, you have a sculpture of uh, Verrocchio. And to your right, you have uh, the drawing of Leonardo. And we can immediately know in these large drawings exactly which were done by Leonardo. Even in, in, in the paintings, he imagined some monsters like this. He would do these combinations where he thought 
that, of, of a monster that had, uh, you know, the combination of a dragon and a dog and a bird. Uh, but like, you, you, we can tell, we know how, which parts in the collective paintings were done by Leonardo, again, because he was the only one that was left-handed. And if you are right-handed and you're drawing, your lines go from the lower corner left up, right? But if you're left-handed, it goes the other way around. So if you look at this drawing, for example, you can clearly see the lines of Leonardo. And you can see them going from the bottom to the left. So works like these were done by several people. But if you analyze them in a microscope, you can see exactly which were the parts that Leonardo painted. He did, for example, the little dog. It looks almost like floating. He also did the fish. In, in this work, uh, that is uh, the image of uh, Jesus receiving uh, the baptism, he does uh, the left angel. And you can immediately tell because it's more perfect. You see that the hair is better done. And this one, this painting that we see here, the, is, is considered one, the first one that he does completely. Everything is his. And these works are so well done that we can go into the details. I've had like special close-up images. And you can see that every detail is perfect. For example, this is, you can, you can see the, the painting. And now I'm going to go to the backdrop. A lot of many artists just fill it in, put the main figures. But look, look now and now notice the fog, the mountain, the ships. Everything is perfectly drawn, very, very careful. And you, you also see uh, little details that he liked, certain curls in the hair. You see them happening again and again. And then there's a little bit of movement. This is an archangel who is flying. So if you notice this uh, uh, string that he has tied up in his arm, it's like, like he's just arrived, like it's still in motion. And in the, the face of the Virgin, notice again the, the beautiful skin and look at the perfect hair and the tiny details all around the Madonna's face. He would do several, uh, several religious, religious works. Uh, uh, here uh, is a very interesting comparison between the virgin, the mom, and the baby. Notice how the baby doesn't have any muscle, so he's still soft, so his skin is a little bit loose. And from the beginning, you also notice the curiosity of the baby trying to touch the flower that the mom is holding. And then look at the exquisite way Leonardo uh, paints the clothes. Uh, look at, the, at, at that, that bluish uh, cloth and the, uh, behind it there's a little bit of orange and then there's a little stone that is reflective. And look at the comparison of the hands of the mom and the hands of the baby. In this other uh, Madonna, we look at, uh, again, a, a, a mother that is very young. In those days, uh, women had children at 15, 16. Right? It's a very young mom, and she's playful. She's playing with the baby. And uh, in his hands, the baby is touching these little flowers that have the form of a cross. So it's almost like a prefiguration of what would be Jesus. That's, you see the crosses as tiny little flowers. But then again, look at the detail of how this uh, stone in, in the Madonna's dress is also reflecting what is uh, around her. 
this portrait of this girl called Ginebra de Benci would be the first one that Leonardo would do that would not be a religious painting. It's just a girl. And it's one of my favorites. Look at it very carefully. Uh, because he, in this work, he really explores nature. So behind the, the girl, you see uh, the flowers perfectly drawn. And then at the other side of her, you see this kind of meadow with the water and the water is reflecting the, the little trees and the sky is there. This girl, uh, Ginebra de Benci, was highly intelligent. And uh, in those days, uh, men were treated as the intelligent patriarchal society and women were more like, like uh, you know, the mothers, uh, the wives. But here he paints uh, Ginebra looking at us directly. She was uh, a, a woman that liked to think of herself as a mountain tiger, she would say. because She was very brave, very courageous. Uh, again, here we see a close-up of the, the beautiful uh, little trees behind her. And, and, and notice the sense of depth. In this, here you see the, uh, the, the landscape. So we could do, we could take a painting of you. Now this is a small one and it has so much detail. It's so perfectly done. This is why uh, many of his works, he really never finished them. He kept on working them and working them and adding something and that was never in a hurry. You know? uh, I like the, the contrast between the forms of her hair and the forms of the little plants. And then the color of the hair, the plants, the water, uh, the reflection. And also the, the, the details of, of her, her little buttons and her clothing, the, the blue color. And notice how everything has shadow and volume, really perfect the mouth. You know, notice uh, how there is almost like an imperceptible smile. Nothing obvious, but it's, it's there. And notice how he observes perfectly the color of the mouth and the lip. And then uh, the eyes that are deep and lovely. So of, until then, uh, most of Leonardo's work had been mainly in, in, in art. He had done some sculpture, but it was basically painting. But then uh, Berocchio's workshop got a very difficult commission. Do you see the, the dome? This is the, the, the building, the main building in Florence, the dome of the cathedral. Now, if you watch the dome, notice at the top, there's a tiny little ball. I wonder if you can, you can see it. Because what he, he was supposed to do is, uh, the, 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 here you have a, a clearer view. See that tiny ball on top that has the cross? So you see this, but notice how big it is. It, you can see the people that are standing. So even though the, the ball appears uh, tiny, it is very large. And so they needed to think how they were going to transport this ball from the bottom. You're talking of a time when there wasn't electricity, when there wasn't, you know, how are they going to put it up and sustain it there? So Leonardo starts to think in terms of weight, mechanics, how are we going to get that ball up? So this was a, a concern that didn't have anything to do with painting. It had more to do with engineering, uh, with math. But it was for him a very important commission to learn how to do it how to put it up there. So next time you go to Florence, 
now that uh, you see the Duomo, you see that little, remember that that was placed there by a very young Leonardo da Vinci. Now, uh, Leonardo believes that in nature, there are no lines. There's only shadows. There's no lines in, in, in life. And so he tries to, to create portraits with only shadows, with what he calls the claroscuro, that we could roughly translate as clear and dark, in other words, a contrast. Uh, so he does all these studies of dress, of cloth. And to make these figures look three-dimensional, he observes how the light is reflected to give them volume, to make them three-dimensional. So this whole understanding of light, again, artists didn't do that. They just went about painting, trying to do their best. But in Leonardo, you have a, a, a questioning. How does, how does the light reflect on a surface? And how do you use that reflection to create uh, something that looks three-dimensional. Then in those days, painting was flat. Sadly today, most of the artists also paint flat. I mean, a lot of these great discoveries that Leonardo did have been kind of forgotten, probably because there's photography. So a lot of people think, well, there's photography, I don't need to do it by hand. But I recommend if there's any uh, in the audience, anybody that would like to be an artist or is an artist, to, to learn these things of, of Leonardo da Vinci, to get his books, to try to, 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 uh, to, to understand volume, distance, shadows, colors. So this is the way that, uh, that uh, painting was, it's all flat. So by, Leonardo did this little, this little uh, screen that he put these like lines of uh, string, and he put he, when he when he went to draw or to paint, he put that that quadricula, the quadricule, and then he copied what he saw in each of the little boxes. And so he started to create the sense of depth. Because when you look at, at life, you see how things that are farther become smaller than the ones that are right in front of you. So all he discovers the rules of perspective. And he tries to do this work uh, the uh, adoration of the Magi. And he could not finish it because everything he wanted to show in perspective, in depth, like if that painting was not just a flat painting, but that it was like a window, right? Now, later in the Renaissance, artists took a lot of the inventions of uh, Leonardo and did incredible things. Look at this uh, church uh, that has this ceiling and the ceiling is, is, is flat, but through art, it, it makes you imagine heaven. And all these figures are like flying in space. All of these ideas are uh, a product of these few people in the Renaissance that suddenly change this flat 
world that was painted into a vibrant three-dimensional reality. And this concept that everything is, is motion also applies to our own emotions. He does this image of Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome is, is, is a martyr who lives with a lion and the lion is close to him because he helps the lion, he takes a, 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 a needle out of the foot of the, of the lion. And so in this work, what Leonardo wanted to do was to capture all of the emotions in Saint Jerome's face. Now, in those days, uh, artists were often uh, ambassadors. And uh, the Medicis that were very proud of all these artists that had developed in Florence, sometimes sent them to different places. And so uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico sends uh, Leonardo to Milan. And Leonardo was also a great musician. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we have nothing uh, of the music that he did, but he played the lyric, he sang very well. And so uh, he does this beautiful instrument as a gift to uh, the, the ruler of, of Milan. So this man, Ludovico Sforza, uh, was uh, a person that was, the father had kind of taken over uh, in a way that was kind of a little bit forceful. The, he was kind of suspect. And so as a ruler, he always was throwing parties and doing things to kind of legitimize himself. It was not like the Medici in Florence that had wealth for many years and they were fully established. This man was kind of trying to be accepted by society. And, uh, and so Leonardo believes that maybe he can be a good employer. And so he writes him a, a letter this is a letter that was not written by Leonardo. This is a letter written by a right-handed person. But in this letter, he describes all the things that he can do. And you know, he says that he can do all kinds of weapons, that he can design weapons, that he can do uh, architecture, he lists many things. And at the very end, he says, oh, and I also paint. So, he thinks that this man is gonna hire him uh, to do all these weapons. So he imagines these terrifying weapons that he draws. You know, this is a, a car that has these kind of knives and the wheels and cuts the people in the battlefields. Or uh, in those days, when you, you defended the cities with these castles that had high walls, and so people uh, climbed them, climbed in stairs to take over the castle. And so if you see the wall, it has certain holes that people could push to get rid of the stairs of the invading armies. Here you, you see these models that he, uh, that have been done of his experiments. He also proposes a modern city, a modern city where you know, the, the dirty water would go under the city, like today, the sewage. But sadly, well, none of these uh, inventions that he proposed uh, was really uh, adopted by, by Sforza. So Leonardo, while he was waiting, he was getting a little job here or there, he started doing these notebooks. And these notebooks that he, he, he wrote, again, all from right to left, capture 
all of the the questions that he that he would would have. So he would set, for example, things like how 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 does the tongue of a woodpecker work? If he's hitting the wood, how 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 does he avoid hurting his head? And so he realizes that the tongue is long and it can serve to protect the head or issues of, of flight. So questions, observations, drawings, all of these things would be drawn and analyzed by Leonardo. These notebooks were really never, never published. Eventually, uh, Ludovico Forza would, would hire him but not to design weapons or to do a, an ideal city, but to do theatrical plays. Because as I said before, the man was basically trying to impress Milan. And so he did all these functions and plays. And, and so the work that he gives Leonardo is to help him design all these productions. So he does the costumes but also uh, the music and the props. Uh, he designed some instruments like this bell that could be played in different ways. Uh, and he often, when he walks in the streets and he sees people that have interesting faces, he would invite them to his house and he would eat with them and serve them wine and he would draw all these interesting looking people. So uh, in the court, in the palace of Sforza, uh, while he was doing all these plays and all these things and attending these parties, uh, he would uh, participate. He would think of like riddles that he would use to stimulate conversation. Uh, so, for example, he would ask things like, what uh, lives under the earth, survives in darkness, but dies in light? The question would be lies. You know? well, they, they live in hidden, they survive dark, but when exposed, they, they die. You know? So he has all these questions and riddles, he participates in the society, but he also meets all kinds of people. Because in the parties that, that the forces go, we, you have the scientists, you have the architects, and he would meet uh, uh, this man that was interested in math. And he was interested in these uh, figures that have many sides. So Leonardo would learn how to do these drawings so that you could show a geometric figure, three-dimensional. This is, he would do this, this book and it would be the only thing Leonardo would publish during his life. All this knowledge, all these notebooks, all of that would be known many years after his death. He would also uh, become a, a friend of architects like uh, Donato uh, Bramante and Francesco uh, de Giorgio. He would propose reforms in the buildings of the church and these were never approved. But in the process, he discovers uh, a book of proportions. And he starts understanding how do you build uh, churches and buildings? And what is the relationship between people and spaces? And he comes across this idea of proportions. So he would say, for example, that if a man or a woman extends their, your arms, that distance is equal to your height. That it would form uh, a square. 
and uh, and that if you lo look at your belly button and you draw a circle in your feet, in your arms, it would form a circle. Uh, so all of these proportions, if, if this were a live show, I like to invite people to come up with me and we lay on the floor and we measure them and it makes sense. Uh, I, I'm gonna show you a photograph by uh, Rosano uh, Maniscalci. Uh, this was included in the Florence Biennale uh, last a couple, a couple of years ago. But here you see the proportion, you see the, how the feet form a circle. This is a photograph. So all of these, uh, all of these proportions uh, are equal in every person. And they also apply to your face. So you can look at the human proportion and then you can measure yourselves and you can find all of these uh, proportions coming true. Now the, the first really serious commission that he gets from the Duke of Milan would be to do this huge horse that was going to be a monument to his father. And it was going to be the largest sculpture of a horse in the world. And so the same study of proportion that he had done for people, he does it for horses. So he measures everything, he, he calculates uh, all of this. And, uh, and this is like the size of the horse that he was going to do. So he invents a whole new way of casting uh, the metal. But unfortunately, when everything is ready, uh, the Duke goes to war. And instead of giving the medal to Leonardo to cast the giant horse, he uses it to make cannons uh, in the defense of Milan. Now, the work in the horse is very important for Leonardo because for the first time he gets paid well and he gets to do a big, he gets a, a large workshop where he can practice. He has the resources and he has the space. And so even though he couldn't do the horse, but now he can think of even larger things. And something that obsesses Leonardo is flight, human flight. He studies it like uh, nobody had uh, before. And he concludes, he, he thinks of all these possible ways of having wings. Many of the inventions of Leonardo were not made possible in his age because he didn't have the energy source. He didn't have electricity or oil you know, to, to propel these these, but some of them do work, like the parachute. He even imagines a, a helicopter. And he imagines machines. He is the first one to think of a bicycle. But more than a bicycle, he uh, understands how machines work. And he understands that he tries for, for, for a long time, he tries to explore the idea of perpetual motion. But he realizes that perpetual motion is impossible because there is friction that eventually stops the machine. However, if you put oil in the machine, it lasts a lot longer. To this day, we continue to put oil in machines to uh, make them uh, work. Now, any of these machines that he was proposing and designing could have easily made him a, a fortune. For example, he invents a machine to do needles. 
can you imagine the amount of, of people that would have needed his needles? But that would have required that he stopped thinking of other things, that he stopped doing his art, that he puts a workshop, that he hires people, and that he dedicates himself exactly to do that, which is not what he wanted. He just imagined things, designed them, but then he wanted to have the freedom to move on uh, to other ideas and to other things. And the amazing thing is that uh, at the same time, that he's doing theatrical productions, imagining scenery, thinking about doing a giant horse, casting the horse, going around the town, imagining uh, uh, an ideal city, in, in, in imagining machines, all of this. He continues to do art, not too much. In, in reality, Leonardo's works are not I mean, other painters or even somebody like, say, Michelangelo that we will see next week does much more than he does. He does not too many, but every one of them is better and better. This is one of my favorites, uh, the Virgin of the Rocks. He would paint it two times. And we see this, uh, the, all of these ideas that, that he was thinking are reflected in his works. So look at the, at the perspective, the distance. He discovers, for instance, that uh, as things go farther, the, the color also gets less bright as things go deeper. And uh, as I said, he would look, look at the way that he does the leaves and the way that the lights reflect on the leaves in the rocks. And then other things like that he has in many of his works, the, the hair, the skin, and the perfect forming of the shapes just with shadows. This uh, portrait of a musician is the only portrait he would do of a man. And in this case, uh, he would make a mistake because he thought that an eye, the pupil of an eye would dilate separately. So if it was closer to the light, it would dilate more. Now we know that the pupils dilate at the same size. But for example, here, if you look at the right pupil, it's a little bigger than the left eye. And he would also do uh, portraits. Many of these were the lovers of the Duke. Uh, but in each of these portraits, uh, Leonardo would, uh, this one is uh, uh, Cecilia Galerani, and she has this little animal, uh, uh, the hermit. It's, it's, it's an animal uh, that is white and so clean that the people trap them by putting mud because the little animal prefers to let itself be captured than to get dirty. But notice the perfection of the animal. Look how every hair is carefully drawn. Look at the head. The painting or the little drawing that just sold for $12 million is a bear, but that looks similar to this little animal in the hand of uh, the woman. Here uh, in this portrait of Lucrezia Crivelli, uh, uh, what, what is very interesting is the direct way in which she looks at us. And then of course, look, look at how directly her eyes are gazing at us. And he would also not only paint, but think about painting. And for Leonardo, uh, painting was superior to the other arts. He would say, music lasts a second, whereas a painting can last forever. And when he compares painting to poetry, he says one image can contain thousands. 
uh, of words. So he would write a whole treaty on painting. Now, he would get to do a mural of the Last Supper. Unfortunately, this mural has deteriorated a lot uh, with time, partly because Leonardo did not like to work uh, in the fresco technique because the fresco technique has to be done very fast. Next week, uh, when we study Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel, you, know, you, you have to do all that when, when it's called fresco because you have to paint when the wall is still fresh, right? But Leonardo did not like to work fast. He liked to take forever working every detail. And so he doesn't use the fresco technique and he combines techniques that didn't, doesn't work very well. Eventually, a lot of the painting uh, fell. But in this work, uh, what, uh, what he is discussing in this Last Supper uh, is the reaction of the apostles when Jesus tells them that one of them is going to betray him. So he says, one of you is going to betray me. And so then you have how these words trigger the reactions. But observe the, the perfect perspective that is used in the painting. And then how all of it is carefully measured. So first you have Jesus that, that says this. And then you have Bartholomew, James, the minor, and Andrew. And, uh, and you can notice their reactions by their faces, but also by their hand gestures. You have Judas. Peter, and John. So Judas is in the front, and uh, you can see kind of his dark expression. He's the one that's going to betray him. And uh, he's ugly, and he has uh, in his right hand uh, the money. And then he's stretching, he's reaching out to the bread, because Jesus says, whomever touches the bread will betray me. Then you see uh, Peter... Uh, going uh, forward, and you can see he has a hand, uh, a dagger in his hand, and John, that is kind of, uh, with looks almost like feminine. In, in this movie about the Da Vinci Code, they speculate that it's not really John, that it's Mary Madeline, but that is not true. Then you have Thomas, James the Greater, and uh, Philip. And Thomas has like this finger. He's the one that would later touch Jesus's wounds. You know? And uh, then you have uh, Matthew, Tadeus, and Simon. And again, notice the, 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 the language of the hands. There is a, a Spanish artist Gloria Marco Munuera, that did a whole study of all the different hand gestures in the Last Supper. But sadly, as I said, uh, this painting has, uh, has suffered uh, enormously. Uh, imagine in still in, in you know, a few years after Leonardo's death, Somebody opened, uh, some of the priests cut part of the mural to open a door. And then in, in World War II, the Allies bombed Milan and almost destroyed the mural. The mural was saved because some of the local people put these bags of, of earth to, to protect it. Another mural that uh, Leonardo tried to paint was in La Sala de la Asi. And he was going to do all these, like, like, like a forest, 
and with it, it create all the feeling of the forest. But sadly, again, the, the mural has uh, deteriorated and we just have some of what, what could have been uh, perhaps the greatest uh, painting of nature, which is some remnants of what it could have been. Eventually, uh, Ludovico Forza is kicked out of power and uh, Leonardo leaves. He goes through Venice and Venice is a city that has all these channels. And so he imagines defending the city and he designs scuba diving, a way to, to walk in the water and breathe outside. That is now of course uh, used, but at the time, uh, nobody uh, practiced it. Then in, uh, in Mantua, he meets uh, this woman, a wealthy woman, Isabella de Este, that was obsessed with having uh, Leonardo painter. But Leonardo just did not just work for money. If he was not really interested in the person, he wouldn't do it. He just does this drawing, even though this woman kept asking him and kept sending emissaries. The good thing about it is that those people that went on her behalf to try to convince uh, Leonardo to work her would describe what the workshops of Leonardo looked like at the time. And they would describe some of the paintings like this famous uh, Madonna with the beautiful landscape behind. Or uh, this uh, image of uh, the Virgin and her mother, Saint Anne. So you see the, the, the connection of uh, the Virgin. Some people look at this work and find like an antecedent to the Mona Lisa. And again, you see the perfection, look at the pebbles and their feet, and then look at, at the smile of the Madonna and the background. And then you look at, at the figure of baby Jesus holding on to the lamb. Uh, the only nude that Leonardo painted is lost. Uh, we only have the, the sketches that he did of Leda and the Swan, which is inspired in Greek mythology. And the idea is that Zeus falls in love with this uh, woman and he becomes like uh, uh, a swan. Uh, some people have done uh, copies of what they think Leonardo painted. And some of them, you see the, the, the babies of Leda and the Swan coming out of uh, these uh, eggs. But these are again copies, not the original Leonardo paintings. So now that, that he's, he doesn't have uh, Ludovico Sforza, he's trying to find a new patron. And he works for a man that is extremely cruel and, 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 and terrible a man called Cesare Borgia. There wasn't really any crime that this man did not commit. He was a, 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 a warrior and uh, he hires Leonardo. This is the passport that he gives him so that Leonardo can move freely in all of his uh, domains. And these little sketches, some believe that they are portraits of Borgia. So, with Borgia, some of his uh, war machines are put into effect. Among other things, he designs this very interesting bridge that could be used, could be easily built, and could be used to cross uh, rivers. But perhaps the greatest contribution that Leonardo does to war and in general in, in the military field is the creation of perfect maps. And he designs a machine to measure the distances so that he could create perfect maps. Think of it, without an accurate map, battle is impossible. However, uh, he, he's interested in battle and what battle looks like. And he makes copious notes of all of this, but it gets to a point where 
the cruelty of Borgia is such that he can't take it anymore. At some point, he orders uh, a close friend of Leonardo to be hung, and that's too much for Leonardo. Uh, he leaves him, and uh, it's a good thing because uh, a mind like Leonardo and working with a man like Borgia could have been very dangerous. Among other things, Leonardo had suggested uh, to divert the river to flood an enemy of the Borgias. Fortunately, this never happened. But Leonardo had created all the machine, had designed it and make the calculus. And uh, imagine the destruction that that would have created. So after Borgia, he goes back to his home city in Florence, where he had not been in many years. Uh, Florence had been under the influence of uh, Savonarola. Savonarola was this uh, priest uh, that uh, uh, was a total fanatic, uh, a man who organized what they call the bonfire of the vanities, in which he said that he would burn everything that, were, that was not essential. In this way, many books were burned, many works of art were burned. Eventually, Savonarola himself would be burned and condemned by uh, the Pope. But in Florence, uh, Leonardo gets a commission to paint a mural on a battle. And it would have been one of the greatest murals because Leonardo had seen battles. He understood what the dust looks like in the battlefield and what color does it have. He had studied anger in people and how do you paint anger? And not only anger in people, but also anger in horses. So this mural, and he does this big drawing uh, of it this big draft uh, would have been perhaps the, the definitive work on war. And he has a, a lot of rivalry with Michelangelo, that then is a very young man. Uh, they get in, in, in a fight, they get in a, I think unfairly for Leonardo, because Michelangelo uh, was a devoted fan of the writer Dante. And so in one occasion, when they're walking uh, together, uh, they ask Leonardo a, a question about uh, Dante. And Leonardo sees that Michelangelo is there and so says, well, ask, ask, ask Michelangelo. But he wasn't trying to make fun of Michelangelo. He was just referring them because Michelangelo knew more about the subject than he did. But Michelangelo took it very wrong. He thought that Leonardo was making fun of him. And so he answered very angrily, you know, and he said, you that cannot even cast a horse, uh, you respond. So they had a bad, bad rivalry. And so in this place in Florence where Leonardo was going to do a mural, Michelangelo was do, going to do another mural. This is Dante, the writer over which they had the conflict. And uh, here in this painting by Raphael, you would see in, in the back uh, an image of, that is inspired by Leonardo, the one that has this kind of orange tunic. And in the front, you see Michelangelo. So to the back with the beard is Leonardo and in the front is Michelangelo. So here is the Palazzo Vecchio, and in one side was gonna be the mural of Leonardo, and the other, it was gonna be the mural of Michelangelo. So unfortunately, nothing survived. Rubens did a, a drawing uh, inspired by Leonardo's mural, and we have some drawings of uh, Michelangelo's project. While still in Florence, you know, uh, Leonardo would not do uh, works uh, that he didn't uh, believe in, even if 
the people were paying him uh, a lot. You know, so this woman, uh, they stated, wanted him to pay her, he didn't pay. But he meets this beautiful girl uh, that is married to this man, Giopondo. And uh, he begins to paint her. And this girl is lovely, has kind of a beautiful smile. And Leonardo wants to make her happy. So he brings uh, jesters and comedians to play for her so that the girl is smiling while he paints her. And this, of course, would become uh, the most famous painting in the world, uh, the Gioconda or the Mona Lisa. Sadly, the, the painting is so popular that when you try to see it in, in Paris, it's just a mass of people. It's very difficult to really uh, uh, enjoy it. But uh, the painting is, is, is the fame of the painting is well, uh, well deserved. Uh, again, the, the perfection of the hands and the perspective within the painting. The hand seems to be closer to us than the rest of the body. And then if you look at the nature behind the figure, it seems to go in and, and to flow with herself. And the eyes, if you move, they look, they look at you. Really uh, remarkable. Now, some people wonder, how did he do this perfect smile? Well, Leonardo was a student of anatomy. He often went to the morgue where they had the cadavers and he studied the cat. And he does, for example, if you look at all these studies of the mouth and the muscles. And so it is hard to believe that an artist like him would actually go to this and, and open up a, a cadaver and look how it was built and then come in there and, and paint uh, a perfect smile because he understood the muscles behind it. This is, watch it carefully, the most famous smile in the world. And here you have a, uh, another uh, vision of, of this work, uh, the way that uh, she looks at us, the balance between nature and uh, the figure, the, the perfection of the skin, and that smile that with the, the eyes that look at us, that invite us, you have this presence of, of warmth. This is a, a painting that uh, Leonardo never finished. He would take it with him wherever he went and he kept adding it, perfecting it. Uh, it is said that it had beautiful eyebrows, but we don't see them anymore, probably because he added them later and they fell off the painting. He would uh, be unhappy in Florence. He was uncomfortable with the rivalry with Michelangelo. Then uh, the father dies and doesn't inherit anything to him because he's illegitimate. So he decides to go back to Milan. And in Milan, uh, there is now a, a, a governor appointed by France that admires uh, Leonardo and allows him to go to the university and to look at all the anatomy studies that they're doing there. So this is a period where Leonardo really looks into the human body. And every time that they're opening a body, he would draw all the muscles. He would draw the stomach, the liver, uh, the muscles, every muscle. For example, this is a, a body of a man that was 100 years old. 
and he died. And so he was able to explore his body. And he discovered that the reason of his death was that his veins had gotten hard with osteoporosis. He also draws the bones, all the, the structure of the body, the spine and how it works. And the combination of muscles and bones. He understands uh, the heart. So you could say that he is the pioneer, not only of anatomy, but also of, of cardiology, of dentistry of the female body and of the origin of life. Some of the most beautiful drawings of Leonardo have to do uh, with uh, babies and how the baby is formed inside of the mother's womb. And what is also remarkable is how uh, Leonardo begins to put together his ideas. And for example, if you look at this, you can compare the way that he draws the hair and the curls of the hair with the forms of a flower and the flow of water. He is briefly in Rome with the Pope Leo X. And there he does this portrait of St. John, also with a mysterious uh, smile. And he finalizes his career in France. So in, in France, uh, he's treated very well. He's given a, a, a beautiful uh, space uh, to live. Uh, the king admires him and likes to talk with him. And Leonardo gets a chance to do the only weapons that he would do in his life, which are uh, cannons of fantasy. So in the parties, these cannons that he does, this, throws all these beautiful uh, festive forms in the air. Now, some say that he is the author of this painting that was sold for uh, millions and millions of dollars, something like 500 or $400 million. I don't believe the painting is authentic. And I, and I say this because I look at that uh, glass that Leonardo has in his hands. While I was in, in Florence, I got exactly the same one, which is this. That is, a, a, they use these balls to create like magic. And so they move them and they, it's, it's very interesting. But compare this and the optics with that that is holding. So Leonardo didn't do this type of mistakes. Here you have, you can see it. I even have a, a photograph. This is uh, what we believe is Leonardo's uh, bedroom. And uh, uh, till the end, uh, Leonardo continued to work in paintings like the Saint John, the Mona Lisa, the Virgin and Saint Anne. And also his thoughts on the world. He was obsessed with the flow of water, images of the deluge. And nowadays with, uh, with global warming and the way that that the seas are changing. I remember some years ago, they had this movie called Aquarella. And, and they show you these angry oceans that are rising. And it gave me a chill because a lot of these waters moving look a lot like the images conceived by Leonardo. This angry, twirling uh, waters. 
this is the last, the last thing he wrote. He was uh, thinking about a geometry problem with triangles. And uh, he was uh, still, uh, at the same time, you see different concerns. But the last thing he says that he has to stop because he says, la minestra si freda. He had to leave because the soup was getting cold. He probably was in the middle of this thought and they were calling him, the soup was getting cold. So he, he, would, uh, he would die uh, the 2nd of May of 1519. And some artists have painted the king, uh, Francis the I, uh, conforting him in his death. Some historians think it's not possible. They document that Francis was some other place. But I think that uh, the image has uh, remained because we like to think of the idea of uh, a monarch uh, paying tribute to this extraordinary artist and scientist. So in closing, uh, I would like to invite all of you not to look at, at Leonardo as an icon, no, and, and, but, but to see him as an example, as an example of things we can do. If you are an artist, try to master Leonardo's techniques. Try to be good at, uh, at learn the laws of perspective. Study optics. Keep your curiosity alive. Keep asking questions. I think that is the most important thing. Human knowledge begins with asking questions. <laughs>